The darkened man sat in the classroom, gazing through the looking glass toward a life that could have been. His eyes, irritated from emotional outpour and lack of sleep, fell wet. A crash of thunder came from the clouded mine above, as the water left in rivers trailing desperation along his face. Trip. Trap. Trip. He watches his collection splash onto his desk, swirling into a pool. It was a deep pool, deeper than Tyler had ever intended. Oh, sweet Sarah. The man traced his thumb along the side of the photograph of his beloved's face. I want to be the most for you. The picture was old. Tyler was old. He was old and now with an overindulging understanding grasp of drowning in life's pressures. There was a time when he was inspired, lungs full of gun and hoe, and his fingers itching to dance across the keys as his mind sang him a memorable song from God knows where, as was the time in the photo. The two lovers were beams, she of joy and he of vision. She was happy, he yearned toward the most the world had to offer, but now he was old tired and stuck in life's rut. The picture had filled him with fleet glimpses of hope for a while. He hoped for a book deal, he hoped to be a father, and find the same love for his beauty as he had in his twenties. Now, hope just seemed to… hope. What was that word anyhow? He did not care to find it. He did not manage to grasp its meaning longer. Yet, when he looked into Sarah's eyes and felt her soul smile, his own had been the first thing he lost when the shadow veiled over his life, a shadow that cast over him the visions. The horrible concepts are wavering in their brutality. Night after night after night after night after night only coming and coming and coming until the man with the hat came into his bedroom, stealing hours to days to weeks of sleep. He knew it was, for he had seen him true in his nightly paralysis. Nights spent resting were soon spent waiting on the demonic assault to overcome his body. Was it demonic? He had no other word to describe such a force, yet it didn't seem right. No point in staying up wondering about that factoid, for his memories were too berated by this dark fantasy reality he dreamed in. Who knew that even the eye of one's mind could too grow weary? The salt of his memories had stung momentary clarity into his wounded mind and shot his eyes open towards the past trap behind the ebony frame. If anyone can make me hope again, it is you. Tyler picked up the portrait as the headstorm broke through the clouds. The memory held to a discovered dream. Now. He needed to wake up. He spent too much time speculating on what his mother called could've beens. But there was no point in debasing oneself too far from the truth. The truth was that no matter how much the two tried for a child, his seed remained spoiled. Tyler was used to rejection, but it was at such a moment he found his Sarah. In 1995, Tyler attended his creative writing study at Washington State University. It's pulp. Professor Trout pronounced her piece professorially, purposely petitioning proper pronunciation per the people's proposal proclaimed post the Proto-Germanic period. In other words, yes, it was pulp. Yeah, I know. But... What do you think? Tyler asked with an earnest edge. His professor looked down at the title page. I'm thinking you made about 90. Her tone was as dry as the wood she stood on. But 
Is it good? He asked. Do you enjoy it? It's pulp. Some hate it, and few can't stand it. The wetness on his face had agreed. Sure, it's no Hemingway. I understand that. But does every piece of English publication need to be written as if it's the next Pulitzer Prize? Give me a good writer, and give me a good storyteller. Seldom can you narrow your options to one man, Mr. Maston, and unfortunately, I find you neither. He sunk deep. The paper was crushed beneath the surface of his hands as the riptide of his professor's words carried him out into the hall. Hmm. It's my preferred juice, you know. Tyler had jumped before he turned around towards the suspiciously sneaky and pretty socialite who followed him from the study hall. What? Paul, I can't stand the regular juice. Thank you kindly. I'll drink it as God intended, with sustenance. It was the first time he ever saw her smile, her laugh, her. Plus, a girl can only take so much of Hemingway before she wants to put a shotgun to her face. She had mimed out the horribly dark joke. It made him laugh. <laughs> Go out like a rock star? Not the worst way, I suppose. He followed up by literally jesting her with his elbow. Hey! You leave Pixie Meat alone. She laughed and playfully hit his arm, and with the other, empathetically wiped away a tear of laughter or remorse towards Kurt. Who can tell in the faces of comedy? She pointed to the wad in his hand. Now, will you let me read your work or not? Tyler looked down into his hands at the crinkled up papers and back up towards the pretty stranger. Why would you want to do that? I write garbage. Bummer, she said. I was looking forward to rummaging through your garbage like a raccoon. She winked at him and filled him with mixed emotions. Had he already been smitten by this woman? Tyler's eyes had widened as a child who hears the bells of Santa slay. Cover it! The words came out as one long string of barely coherent gibberish. He collected himself. If you like it, it may give me a reason to stay in for the next semester. But he had already found it. He straightened out the paper on his pants leg and handed her the script. Sarah took his work and began to read through it. Tyler's heart beat fast as he watched her face for the slightest reaction. She smiled, laughed, and handed the paper back to Tyler. You know what? You are funny. Tyler, who was under the impression he wrote a space drama, was taken aback by this approach. Did you like the story? You paint a story like John Van Eyck. But your writing is closer to the late Picasso portrait. You have too many words, and your characters all sound like robots. Except, somehow, the robot, whose prose reminds me of Heathcliff. Do I want to live? Would you like to live with your soul in the grave? However, I do think this is creative. There was no pause between the words is and creative. This revelation led Tyler to believe she was genuine with him, and it made him blush. I would consider staying enrolled for the next semester. She laughed and gave him an elbow. Most might have taken the comment as an insult, but Tyler saw there was more to that. She wanted him to get good at writing. As opposed to Trout, Sarah seemed to give a damn about his stories and their potential. In the spur of the moment, Tyler grabbed hold of the opportunity. Would you be willing to peer review my stories? I, I have a lot more that I've worked on over the years, but the characters are all just me. You know? Free stories? Never, she proclaimed to the heavens. Then, in the fashion that one would only know growing up in the 90s, not, I'd love to. It was simply the best rejection 
he could have received. The two had gone from day-to-day friends to late-night lovers. It was in the quad they had spent most evenings. Sarah would be with Tyler's stories, red pen in hand, while he subdued under the creative spell of his mind. Dance. Sarah would hear the thundering of keys as Tyler's fingers shot across the tabs like lightning in an attempt to catch the thoughts that swam in his mind. Lightning in a bottle is what she called this familiar tango. And while many errors had lain in their latter relationship, rejection was simply not a word in Sarah's lexicon of love. Line after line, Sarah helped Tyler find his voice. And it was in the year 97, he spoke up and proposed. Soon, rejection seemed to be a haunt of his past. But this wasn't the past anymore. Nor was Tyler sitting on the quad. He was not working on future stories, but at a desk in the present darkness. Only an empty class, a red pin, and a pile of corrections needed fixing. Nothing came out of his writing. Nothing but pulp. The man scoffed before once again getting caught in Sarah's gaze. The picture had been taken in O2. Tyler did not trust to believe Sarah had been with child, but Glee filled his cup as the child filled in her womb in those coming weeks. Tyler would spend his days teaching creative writing and evenings planning a nursery, all in preparation for their baby girl to arrive. Tyler didn't have to force a smile for the first time in a long time. Two months into their pregnancy, The winds changed direction and called them to move out of their cheap bohemian apartment to a small town of 2,100 strong in Yakoma County called Tenenact, and the South thinks it has it hard with names. At the time, Sarah, sweet, loving Sarah, had a problem giving out money at her sister's request. To Tyler's suspicion, Madison knew this information and took advantage of his wife time after time. Madison and her husband Adam had been heavy pill junkies. Mostly, they stuck with speed, ADHD medication, and the sorts. But things escalated after Adam's knee injury. Adam was hooked instantly by the opium, and soon Madison followed in her lover's footsteps. The two were attached to the painkillers all while trying to raise little Hank the Tank. It was not long after then when the needles came into play. One evening, Madison had called with her usual lines. Sarah loved her sister. Therefore, Tyler did too. Still, he knew there was only one reason the Mosleys called. Maddie, I'm only asking because I love you. But Tyler and I sent over a check two weeks ago. Are... are you and Adam using again? He couldn't make out her words, but he knew her usual bullshit cadence and his checkbook. Why are you lying? I know you cashed it, Maddie. I I can't just keep giving you money when you two are fighting this. Still unable to hear her. Tyler knew she would be talking about Hank's safety. How ironic. I don't want anyone to take him away either, but both you and Adam need to get some help. You can't keep going down this path. Is Hank safe with you when he can get his hands on who knows what at any moment? This tone had been a change in Madison's typical script. He had sat up from his bed, placed the book down, listened intently. I'm not your enemy, Maddie. Her cries came through the phone, chilling his bones through their discourse. Iron nails scraping against a chalkboard in the pit of the damned made no comparison to such a noise. No, no, you don't need to do that. 
I'll call work in the morning. After that, we can drive over and help watch Hank for you. You need to get better, girl. I, I love you all too much to be able to see this happen. Start looking around for some sinners, yeah? Okay. I love you. Bye. Sarah hung up the phone and looked over toward Tyler. Are you able to cancel your lessons for next week? It was with a strange reluctance that he agreed. A week later, the two of them arrived and knocked on the door. Tyler could hear the TV playing in the background. Nobody had answered. He had rung the doorbell. No answer still. They had called the landline with their cell phones, barely able to listen to its ring under Kermit the Frog's sing-along. A cheery voicemail greeted them. Tyler reached for the handle and opened the unlocked door to a house that would belong on a premiere show later in his life called Hoarders. Hank, age two, was sitting alone in front of the TV, watching the Muppets and playing with his sippy cup in one hand and an empty pill bottle in the other. Tyler quickly ran over to the toddler and inspected him for any signs of poisoning. After seeing Hank had been fine, he left the room to find Adam and Madison lying in their bed with lines of who knows what waiting for them on their nightstand when either they decided to wake up from their unconscious state or when their bodies would let them. Tyler had asked Sarah to take Hank to the local park. Tyler was never much of a yeller. Hell, he never even grew with rage. But this had been his life's expectation. Tyler and Sarah had rented a motel room and stayed with Hank over the next several nights. That was when Sarah told him they could not go back to Seattle. They terminated their lease and put a mortgage on a house a few streets over. Tyler got his job teaching the youth of Tananak High in Yakoma ISD, while Sarah started working as a full-time mother and a part-time librarian in the town, all while new life formed inside her womb. The picture had been taken in celebration of their new lives. The two finally bought a home, though not where they expected, and were waiting patiently to welcome their lively girl into the world. They had kept their eyes on Adam and Madison, making them swear they would stay off the hard stuff. On weekends, they would invite the whole family over, and both Adam and Tyler occasionally drank, Madison joining in. On the weekdays, Sarah would go above and help her sister with Hank, while her sister helped Sarah with the pregnancy. Then, one morning, shortly after finally settling in, the unthinkable happened. She, she's not moving. Sarah's eyes ran wet with horror struck thoughts. There was one trip to the ER and many more to the grief counselor. Never in his life had Tyler had to watch something so painful, so heartbreaking, and so null. The weeks grew quiet, and the mural in the nursery was soon covered up in a tacky, one-and-done, cheap yellow wallpaper. It had been such an ugly settlement, but what had he deserved? It'll be easy to tear down, he told himself, for when we do have another child. But wishful thinking was only so. In the nights... Tyler would fall into his sheets like a stone in a lake, and as his thoughts carried him like a leaf in the wind, he began his search for the unfound door where once dreams reside, waiting to be. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door. He was a slave to this realm, forever prison pent to the waking thoughts and whispers of death soon to come. Tragedy had halted Tyler's writing for good. No longer could he spend long nights dreaming of the wondrous worlds of science fiction. Instead, Tyler spent long nights following the haunt of his life in the old nursery. 
Sarah told him he had been sleepwalking, but Tyler knew he was lucid. Awake, or was it just part of him? He became obsessed with the notion the shadow was an omen to come, not a stain of the past. That, no matter what Tyler and Sarah would try for, the man would come back to lay claim to his child like a Rumpelstiltskin. What is your name? Sarah, even if God grants us with this blessing, do you want to risk it? Her face was a gradient of joy and fear. We both want a family, Tyler, and there's only one way we can make that happen. Plus, she poked her arm into his ribs. He batted her arm away. I just don't want to feel rejected again. His lips twitched. She had quivered. Again was what struck the most. Hey, as long as I'm with you, rejection shouldn't exist. No matter what, we are more than enough, okay? It didn't sound like a lie when she spoke it, mainly because he didn't want it to be true. They had tried for years and both knew, even if she did get pregnant, the baby would be at high risk for problems. Tyler began to grow depressed. Both he and Sarah were hopeless in their efforts to raise their kin. This helplessness grew as tragedy once again dug its claws through the Maston mosley family's hearts. Yet, through the death of one came the life of another. In 2004, six months pregnant with her second child, addiction took Madison. Madison Mosley died of a drug overdose, while Gregory Mosley withered in her womb on borrowed time. Against the impossible, life managed, and Gregory Mosley came into this world quiet as a mouse, with a weak heart, but alive and stable and still pumping strong through this story's end. Tyler was beyond angry at Adam and demanded that he and Sarah needed to take custody of the children. Sarah had blamed herself for being tied up in everything and that she couldn't keep a watchful eye over her sister. Tyler never wanted to beat someone as much as when Adam was holding Gregory. Adam's eyes stone d dry as he grieved the loss of his life and celebrated the miracle of his second son. Tyler and Sarah kept the children under their supervision for two years per the state of Washington. The events devastated Adam, and he pleaded to his children that things would change from that day on. He got on his knees, and he promised Tyler he would live his life in total sobriety. Tyler took Adam's vow with a grain of salt, but as time passed, Adam spent his days bettering himself to become the father his children needed. Soon, Adam proved to the state and to the Mastins that he was capable of caring for his children. Adam swore off the drugs forever, even refusing to take an opioid after his second knee surgery, and soon began working at Ferry County Rehabilitation Clinic as an RA. He never took up the bottle or smoked a single joint after legalization. He had been stone sober for two years. The Mastins had been proud of Adam, of course, but... The jealousy of having a family grew inside Tyler like a mustard seed. He continued to teach, love his wife, and to be a good husband, yet his head called him a failure. So, he sat in the dark of his classroom, waiting for the all-too-familiar presence of the dark man's shadow as his thoughts drifted through time. Tendrils of fibrous knoll began inching from the corners of Tyler's sight. They slinked like worms and pulled apart like loose, oily hair. They became knotted in the formless collection presented in the center of his vision. 
In an undiscerning moment, the strands became wholly erect, peering over Tyler in a demanding stature. It drew chills down his spine, sucking the life right from his eyes into its hold. He found himself paralyzed in not fear, but in acceptance of his choice. He was done being afraid. He was done being a prisoner. The long, shadowed figure crouched down at Tyler's desk, breathing deeply from what hid behind its veil. The raspy whisper of Shadow's thoughts began to scream into semi-audible vulgarities, building one upon the other. You, you, never, never, ready, ready, father, father, failure, failure, failure. As Tyler's head began to fill with madness, the pressures of horrific mental imagery grew louder and louder. Still, he needed to release his mind. He needed to find a door out. The man with the hat waved death towards him. It read, Come to me. So, he went. He stood up from the desk. His body shook from the pins and needles that come from corpse play. The feeling was the closest he had gotten to sleep in the previous months. He lifted the coffee mug from his desk to take a final sip and found the bottom instead. <sighs> Cups all empty, he said with a giant yawn and stretch. He sat the mug down and rubbed his own. His vision refocused on the room's obnoxious fluorescence, with no trace of the tall tarantula appended shadow monster. Instead, he spotted the clock. It read a quarter until nine, only twenty minutes remaining until first period began. The unread papers of summer essay sat in a pile twice as high as the ones he had skimmed. So many corrections in such little time. Would anyone mind if he just gave up? The students mostly wouldn't care. Sarah would be disappointed when she got the word, though. And what kind of example would that be for Hank, who would be in the same class the next year? But... You are losing it, Tyler. He looked up to find himself alone. Was that his voice? The hallucinations from sleep deprivation were growing intense as Tyler's internal clock drifted further and further from structure. Reality? Losing it? He questioned. So what? He scoffs. You know what? He did know. He was losing it. Slowly, the venom had crept into his mind. It had started with a dream. Soon, it became jealousy, and at his worst, he struck with hatred. Now, he felt pity. Was it for himself? Maybe. He had risen from his desk and walked out of the classroom. He turned the lights off and locked the door on the way out. The halls filled with students of all ages each rushing to finish their summer assigned work, searching for the new classrooms and catching up with old peers. He ignored most things as he walked to the town community center. Tyler, single-minded, shuffled across the busy field. As he walked across the football practice, Bradley Moore blew his whistle. Can you not walk on our field during practice, Mr. Maston? Tyler, briefly waking up. When did I get here? Lifted his hand in a weak effort to apologize, then hurried to the other side. Swimming? Was he... No. He was not swimming. The sky filled with dark gray blobs, perfect for an arriving storm. Tyler knew he would be swimming soon enough if he didn't hurry along. He ran across the yard and watched the thick chimney smoke clouds puff across the sky, filling it 
with the tears to come. In them, he saw the apparition beckoning. No longer was thought rational. If only it had been that way to start. And by the time sense came back to Tyler, it would be too late. Tyler sludged across the asphalt of the CC's empty lot, with his eyes never glued to the shadow sitting on the roof. The building was small by most standards he had been used to growing up, but considering everything in the town, it was of adequate size. Tyler opened the gate into the CC, turned towards the gym, and found a hefty kettlebell. He picked up the weight from its handle and, in a crouch, began to swing his legs forward towards the closet. He dropped the weight in a thud, nearly missing his foot, and tried for the door handle. He sighed heavily and then took two glances in either direction before picking the weight back up. Thud. 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 Crack! The door swung on its hinges as the lockbox broke free. With a flip of the light switch, Tyler formatted a plan. In the light, he found an assortment of noxiously neon jump ropes tangled together. He grabbed one and tested its strength before throwing it over his shoulder. He picked up the bell and continued down the hall, following the shadow. He could not tell if the ghost had been looking at him or facing forward as Tyler followed. Light ceased to exist as the dark veiled creature passed. Then the shadow passed through the door and into the lap pool. The pool lay perfect, unaware of the storm it would soon share waters with. Tyler looked across its surface and breathed what in normal circumstances would have been a rather goofy smile. The tears of all his life had collected here for him. It was time for him to join them. Never had Tyler felt anything so confident. He sat by its edge, legs plunged deep into the icy crypt. He belonged to the depths from that moment forward. He knew this as the wet cold made its way up his pants leg, numbing his bones. Tyler looked at the weighted anchor and decided to take his final stand. He tied one end of the rope to the weight's handle and the other to his ankles. He created a loop and tested its courage. He judged faithful and lifted the grave standing, teetering over the pool's ledge. What are you waiting for? He answered his reflection with one simple yet profound action. Thunder cracked the sky as the rain began to fall to the pool below. He fell into the waters and saw his reflection staring back at him for one final time. Tyler, in horror, did swim. With miraculous effort, he pushed himself from the pool floor, reaching his fingertips into the air above the surface. But fingers cannot breathe. What have I done? And in one final painful inhale, Tyler's body sunk back down to the bottom of the pool.